Yo, 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 welcome back, man. First smoke of the day. Here with my host, Black Leaf in the building, Pat Gods. Here, your host. Episode 15, man, we got a real, real, real special one. We're coming live from Amsterdam, August 2021. And we're What's in the up, epicenter of hash. Man, we are at the Hash Museum. And we're here, joined by Miss Mila the Hash Queen. How are you? Hi, I'm uh, absolutely fine. And it's great to be here with you guys. Yeah, they know me as the hash queen because I invented the very first machine that separates the crystals from the plant material. I've been making hash for thousands of years, but it was always a manual job. And actually, since that machine, the pollinator, I must say, especially in the Western world, possibility came about that people can make their own hash. They just need a few plants and they can make some hash out of it. For me, I actually only smoke hash. I've tried weed a few times, but, um, you know, the hash, the crystals is where all the cannabinoids, terpenes, everything is right there. So why smoke a bunch of dead green? For me, that <laughs> doesn't really make sense. Because some of it's really fresh. It's sticky. I like that. <laughs> it smells good. And then okay, we got another okay. big guest with us, too. And then joining us as well. Mr. Ed, please introduce yourself, brother. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Ed from uh, Delta 9 Labs. Been here for close 25, 30 years in Amsterdam. Started the breeding company, Delta 9 Labs, back then alone. And, uh, you know, with the strength in numbers and finally getting a quality team to work with and collaborate with, I'm, I'm extremely thrilled with the future holds. Um, it used to be me, 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 and now it's we, 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 with, you know, more people coming on board. Quality uh, director of horticulture we have. Uh, general manager and, and so on and so forth of operations. Our senior advisor is stellar, you know, so again, it's, we feed everything off of different people and stuff like that. And we're really just then final, you know, come with that final answer and stuff. And it's like, it's not all on you, but you f find yourself accountable to other people to, you know, keep on your deadlines and things like that. So the years here of breeding and growing and hustling and dealing and, you know, everything, to, you know, bring different things to the coffee shops and so on and you know, in the beginning and how it evolved where it is now and getting legitimate and going for legal nurseries and stuff and going full circle 30 years later, where America, my own country, you know, that I left to come here to Amsterdam, it's like, like a deja vu, but it's coming full circle to take a go back almost. to my own country and take the knowledge, take the contacts, take the resources, take the languages and, and just the whole culture from here in Amsterdam, where sometimes I even take it for granted, you know, but again, yes, everybody knows that this is the epicenter of the cannabis world and the community and the culture. And when Prop 215, for example, in California, was first starting out and people were getting legitimate in their dispensaries and they were coming here and seeing how the coffee shops were, how were people dealing, how were people growing? And they were, you know, seeing how it was going to then develop mm -hmm. in California or Colorado or whoever, you know, where I'm the first, I'm the first, you know. But again, it evolved and we are where we are. So um, you're an expatriate. Yeah. No, I'm an expatriate. I'm uh, trying to return from exile now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm I mean, in here and I get to my own country finally now. I you, mean, you're such a creative and you put out such fire product. I think we want you back. Cool, right on. Thank you. I'd love to be back and, and collaborate with you guys and everybody. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. You guys are the last of a dying breed as well. Yeah. That has, you know, been blessed to see the beginnings. So take us down a stroll down memory lane of, you know, what it was like and tell us Mila what it was like before flour was available. The hash came before flour. I don't think most people understand that or know that. I started smoking late uh, 90, uh, 64, 65. And uh, at that time there were no coffee shops, of course. And uh, you used to go upstairs somewhere and score hash. There was no flour at all. The hash came from Lebanon, Turkey, Iran, but no Dutch. No. Wow. There was no seed companies in the mid sixties. No. Wow. I, that's, that's amazing. You don't think that and you I, think flour then hash, but it's, it wasn't, it was imported. Yeah. It, I think it was before I left to travel to India in 68 that people were starting to grow the seeds they found in the bird seed packets. So. <laughs> Explain that for the for the listeners. What are the seeds they found in the bird seed packets? In the bird seed packets, there's certain uh, combination. You can buy them for big birds, little birds, and all the rest of it. And some of them have cannabis seeds inside. 
Uh, they are purely hemp. They are not. Uh, ah. This was the origins. Oh. Wow. So even then it was happening. You know, that's happening a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's 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 insane. So, so I never tried it then. And then in 68, uh, they uh, closed my tea house, um, which some claim was like a coffee shop, but it wasn't because people would come from as far as Afghanistan bringing ash, come from the States bringing LSD. And that was too much. Uh, <laughs> at that so time. it was a gathering place. So they place. closed it. Yeah. 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 And we only shared. I never sold anything. We just traded or shared among each other. Amazing. But people coming from all over the world with the best of what they have or what to show. Got. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So, but that wasn't uh, allowed at that time. So I hitchhiked to India and uh, ended up being there till 88. 19. Wow. 88, and then I came back. Still smoking hashish in yeah, India? Yeah, because you can't get weed over there. Yeah. I mean, all the countries, actually all the way from Northern Africa nearly to China, people only smoke hash. Uh, Maybe wow. in the southern areas, like in Thailand and South India, there will be some weed available. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, everywhere else they're smoking hash. And I mean, if that's what they're doing, that's what you want. Don't go against the grain if you go there and be searching for cannabis. Buy the good, buy the right. good hash. Mm -hmm. Now, honestly, because if if you go somewhere, you want the best of what they do. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go against the grain and try something and they're gonna and then you're disappointed and then you say, Well, their weed sucks. Well, they don't smoke weed. So listen to Mila. I mean, amazing yeah, point. Absolutely. Well, in Afghanistan, like for over thousands of years, they've been growing to make hash and not to have weed to smoke. There you go. So even the terpenes and even everything about it's it's meant towards hashish. Yeah. What what was your time in India like? Oh, fabulous! I got there in '68, and uh, yeah, we were among the first uh, hippies in those days. Of course, travelers that uh, went all the way out. Mind you, we didn't hitchhike all the way. In Afghanistan, we had to fly because some people had disappeared, and they wouldn't let us travel overland. Wow! So I flew from. Uh, Western Afghanistan, Herat, up to mazar -e sharif and then over the Hindu Kush down to Kabul. And the reception we got there was just so warm. And I think because we all smoked together and we loved, that was my first introduction into the hookah pipe. And uh, yeah, they were so very open. I traveled with my four-year-old daughter at that time, and I never felt in any way... Um, that I was unwelcome or wow. or anything. So they embrace you the entire time. Yeah, Afghanistan was one of the highlights of my trip to India. Wow. Phenomenal hash? Phenomenal hash. I must say most of the time that I lived in India, I kept those connections going and uh, <laughs> smoked <laughs> Afghan most of the time. Wow. wow. Okay. If, if it was available. Yeah. That shows wow, that's you. amazing. So then from India, I mean, how long did you spend in, in India? Uh, 14 years, but I left in, um, 88. I spent a few years back in Holland in between, came back here. And whereas there was nothing in Amsterdam before, but, uh, in some attic, you could score some hash. <laughs> now there was 240 coffee shops all over town wow. and they all sold weed and some hash. Well, I tried their hash and it was mainly Moroccan and I didn't like it at all compared. I was spoiled. She I was, tried. The, yeah. What, so what, what's I, your, yeah, I tried the weed and that never made it. It was nearly 20 years that I'd been smoking hash. So I never took to. Smoking. And close to the source. You were getting hash very close to the source, which what, it makes a big difference. What area makes your favorite hash? Northern Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And even now, after the wars and all the crazy stuff that has happened, do they still produce that quality hashish? Or is it just less now, hard to yeah, get? Yeah, it's uh, very difficult to get, and uh, it's not really available in the coffee shops of that quality. So you right. almost have to be there. You have uh, to go to, there. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Wow. The ripple effect of, uh, you know, violence and things and, and wars and, you know, disrupt yeah. uh, chains. Is, uh, also, Ash is like that, that inspired Frenchie to go the way that he did with his life. <laughs> Traveling and, and basically yeah. procuring cannabis and cannabinoids. True and curator. Yeah, amazing. We were there more or less also at the same time. Well, he came later than me. 
But I was there just as a smoker. He was really. <laughs> he was making it. He was making. Oh, well, we made it when he was up in the fields and all the women were rubbing the buds. Yeah, we'd join in. But um, he was much more into, yeah. The process. The yeah, process. And Very everything. charismatic. In northern Afghanistan, where you're saying they make the best hashish, uh, do they do the drum beating? Do, or is it mostly rubbing? Like no, they, they do the, they don't. Yeah, they beat it, but not really like a drum. Okay. They beat it very gently. Wow. Okay. See, I mean, makes a big difference. Yeah, technique. Yeah. I've bought videos from different random DVDs I've been able to purchase online or through friends that are almost like videos were made in Morocco and stuff. And they show people, you know, against a rug. And it's, it's a very home video style from a while ago, but it's so interesting to look. It's so different from what we're used to in the States. But I tell you, Morocco learned to make hash from the hippies. I was there in 60, the summer of 65. There was no uh, hash anywhere. What the people were smoking then was tiny buds chopped together with black tobacco and they would put it in their sibsi. Mm. And it was what they called keef, but there was no hash anywhere at that time. And then in wow. 67, 68, and later when people came back from Places in Africa, Afghanistan, Nepal, uh, Pakistan. Yeah, they taught them how to make the hash. So that was a merging wow. yeah. of the cultures. I mean, right there wow. to, to create that. Wow. So, and maybe that's why that. it's so popular and that when you think hashish, you think Morocco. Yeah, well, that became, became one of the biggest producers. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. I mean. So, <laughs> so coming back to Holland, what was, what was your mindset? with everything that you had had and, and everything that was going on at the time. I started growing in 88. Yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. The scene was what, booming. What yeah. was that journey like? And, and especially you not uh, smoking the flower. Well, I was lucky as a teenager, I'd worked on a, a nursery just with regular plants, but I'd learned to make clones. Ah. And so 88, 89, nobody knew how to make clones. <laughs> so I got a wow. good job. Yeah. That's yeah, huge absolutely. propagation, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And being able to continue genetics. Yeah. If you can't make a clone, you can't continue a genetic. Very and different. I mean, for breeders and even growers, that is key. If you find something special and you can't keep that going, it's a lifelong chase. Yeah. You absolutely. Know? This hash is insanely incredible it is yes Thank we're smoking talk about it we're smoking some hey can you beautiful. tell us about this hash we're smoking <laughs> right now brother i mean my head's spinning a little bit yes. I, I, I think i took one too many hits uh I'm happy it's working uh yeah it's i got the permagrant uh, on one of my uh ones from the archives i take it out I keep it always vacuum sealed take it out maybe i don't know two three times a year special events meeting nice new people like yourselves it's, uh, it's one of our uh, OG Kush, the Simpson Kush. It's, uh, this one actually seems to be the, the bubble hash from it. Amsterdam seen a lot of the dry sieve over the years uh, that many people can attest to, but this is a, the bubble hash that just got a great high on it. Amazing. Like I say, you know, it's yeah. like when you knew Very cannabis was going to be a part of your life. You know, and you first smoked it and you had that smile on your face. This brings that kind of high it and does. that smile it's back It's very on sedative your face. too. The high is really nice and very quick onset. It always fascinates me. In like eight seconds, you know, because it's very, very quickly on how the, how, uh, the, the cannabinoids just comes right onto your marijuana receptors. And it's just like counted on two, two hands. Hash immediately That's, hits you right yeah, under right the right eyes away. and very, I feel the quickly. grin come yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. I got to be honest. You guys make me want to smoke hash like at well, nighttime. You know, again, you know like I mean? <laughs> there was, there was, uh oh, really like I'm elevating quality. my, my game a little bit. Very low quality cannabis back in the day. So it makes being sense. So, you know, uh, turned on to and, you know, from, from, you know, where she was in the world and the, the great quality hashes and to come back here and not to find anything even close to, to being equivalent. Then the cannabis back then was just Jamaican basically, or maybe some Thai brickweed. And that's really how it all started. And the new genetics started coming in and different breeding and you know, people from around the world, you know, bringing things in and moving here and so on and so forth. So that transition and, 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 and how it's come to where we are now, I mean, 30, 35 years later, that, you know, the, the coffee shop industry came to fruition and, and there were a bunch of them and they, you know, faded a bunch of them out, you know, with being too close to a school and they're still here and they're trying to new laws and squeeze things out. So one step forward, sometimes two steps back. Again, if you, you don't know where it's going sometimes. All the where, time. Where the places in the world are being far, far more proactive and setting things up properly, licensing things. Yes, it may be costly, 
and, and, and high taxes. But again, it becomes more transparent and figuring out how it's going to work between the, the white market and the black market. It's just the black market is not going to go away anywhere in the world. No, you know, especially, yeah. the especially if they don't figure it out, you know, and, and they the don't issue. offer, I mean, quality, affordable, pro, you know, there's got to be a couple levels. It's, it's so many different. Mm. I have a question though. Is that why you were saying back in the day, right? The hash was king because the weed was so basically terrible that you're basically farming trichomes at that point. Mm. And then you're taking that trichome, you're beautifully washing it with water and you're presenting it either pressed or not pressed. Okay. So it's a cleaner product well, back indeed. then. Sure. But first, you know, uh, first came the dry sift. Okay. And it took another five years nearly before the, the washing the of washing it. Came. Sure, sure. Interesting. At least that early, again, earlier in the hashish that she'll attest to as well, it, it was the, the drumming, the separation of the trichomes, whether it be rubbing it, you know, in India and, and, and so on, in, in you know, India and Nepal and that area in the Himalayas, to then Afghanistan and Morocco and everywhere else where they tapping it over silk screens, drums and so on and so forth and having, you know, double zero and, you know, the, you know, the virgin press and so on and so forth, three, four, five, six times until it's like, yeah, this looks pretty green. I think we're done with it. You know, they put the plant <laughs> yeah. aside and then the rest of the plants just stay stacked up in bundles, drying out in the sun on the side of their house, you know, on the farm, you know, farmhouse. Well, the hash is the premier thing. And then you know, sure, supply and demand. And sometimes there's like, you know, a whole wall, you know, stacked up worth of hash from the year before because hard yeah. to get it out, logistics, you know, warfare, you know, wherever it is in the world. And it's, it's different, but it's a staple product here. I mean, the, some imported stuff, the local hashes, I mean, Mila obviously pioneered that. The, the Nader hash, you know, is all because of Mila, basically, whether it's, you know, from dry sieve and, and, and tumbled somebody nipping over a screen and making, you know, some great hash and ski and, and then collecting it and making it into a ball or keeping it, you know, soft over the years and tapping it on top of hash or lining a paper with it. And then the water processes along the line and, you know, whether it be in a, you know, in a bucket with some material or in a machine. And so again, we, we keep in the rosin and it's like, you know, where we keep going and the, the it's just the, the technology and the science is just keep taking elevation every like a year every six months or whatever, amazing. a year and a half. But yeah, it's amazing. You know, Every time I go to the States, there's a whole new product. I mean, we're, we're in the industry for, for yeah, our with whole extracts, life, right? You know, and something what do you, new comes out is fascinating. What do you, what do you feel about the new products when you try them? Uh, I must say the period that BHO was popular, I kind of skipped that one. But uh, <laughs> I, like I like the rosin, though I find it extremely sticky to put in a joint. Yes. And I like, uh, what's that called? I forget now. It's kind of, that has the crystals at the bottom and the brown terpenes on the top. Diamonds. Diamond and sauce. Sauce. Yeah, sauce yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and diamond. You know, you every like time the sauce? I go, well, we yes, the I like the sauce. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Sure, that is good. Our, our colleague so Greg it's, will it's uh, facilitate in a hit for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smoke a nice diamond on the, on, the, on the episode. Yeah. Yeah, I, I smoke some diamonds with the hashish. Yeah. Oh, 100%. No, no, actually, I'm very happy with it. It's not that I'm expecting everybody to use my type of products forever. That would be a stagnant situation. And you look in everywhere, whether you're looking at architecture, fashion, food even, it evolves. You know? Absolutely. And I'm actually very happy to be in a, the whole hash a pioneer. And, and, and cannabis industry is also evolving. I still know guys that champion dry sift. Um, yeah multiple dry sift techs uh, yeah. and that that's yeah. their number one way that they like to smoke Yeah, because they, and they, I mean, I have guys that want to dry sift full pounds of flowers, you know what I'm saying? And then run multiple screens and then clean it up after. And they, they, to the point where you have a full melt product yes. that you just yes. sprinkle, you touch it with a lighter and it, it almost looks like that after you touch it with a lighter because it, it grabs itself and melts together. Yeah similar to this um, unbelievable wall next to us. <laughs> I mean, pretty crazy. holy cow. It's pretty legendary. There's, there's hash <laughs> on this shelf from literally all over the world. About and, and 75 to a hundred different kinds. Probably yeah. you have some good discipline. Cause I may have broken into a few already. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. You can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, She has. <laughs> this one no, was incredible. But the thing uh, I tell people I need about a quarter gram. Uh, yeah. If I send more. Well, Hey, oh, absolutely. okay. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. But they're all labeled and they have yeah. either a note next to them or a date or a place. I mean, wow. And really from cool. all over the world, places what that is, you would never expect. What is Crocodile USA? It must be some kind of weed called Crocodile that they made it with. 
Wow. Maybe the guy was called Crocodile. Now I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, though. Wow. And then above that, there's a huge, basically a map of the world with hundreds of pins in them to every country that has the, the, pollinator. the pollinator or bags oh, or product to yeah. sieve hash. And when you look at some of these, one of the things we had brought up and talked about was a lot of these countries you do not want to have these products, you know, caught on you. It, it's just very interesting, the passion. And this shows how much passion around the world for this product, because you look at these pins, each pin is a person or even a group of people who have gone out of their way to say like, okay, even though in my, where I do this, this is not an okay process. I want this product and I'm going to do what I have to. I mean, well, also- I'm somewhere on there. I know that. Everywhere on there uh, is where people are growing weed. Otherwise, you wouldn't need these products. There need you go. Exactly. Now it's what, yeah, right. there you go. Right. In 2002, one of those pins was definitely me. I okay. remember my group of three or four guys, is, we used to look at high times and the back of high time. And we would, we would get anything we could. And we would only buy our books with cash. I would go to high Barnes yeah. and Noble, pay cat. And I was like looking behind me, you know, thing. Crazy times in 2002, 2003, trying to be a grower and uh, anything at scale, you know, it's so different. Seeds, very different business. Seeds, you know, again, I, I said this shit at least 15 years ago. The, the seed industry is doing extremely well. You know, the seed companies were sprouting faster than the seeds themselves. And I wrote that in an article 15 years ago. There's new breeders. There's new seed companies every single day, every single week, every month. It's hard to keep up with them. You know, the strain game, the strain name game, you know, and, and, and everybody has a new strain. In fact, several new strains every few weeks, every few months. And it's rename. Again, game. We, we keep, you know, really yeah. just wanting to get things better and better. And, and if we don't like it, then after testing and working with it, it's a lot of lost time. We purge it, you know, and again, we don't try to say, you know, setting the highest standards as our, as our, you know, hashtag, we try to bring that to the industry, you know, with, with uh, our values, our ethics, you know, creating loyalty and trust with our relationships, you know, not just like having fire, you know, fire, fire, fire. It's yes. Long-term relationships where this industry is getting transparent, legitimate, and growing, connecting the dots internationally. I mean, we're consulting for clients in Thailand where, you know, you would have gotten 10, 20 years in jail. We're now we're able to consult legitimately with legitimate companies that are at the forefront of legalization for medical in Thailand. And they're looking um, for seeds and things like for seeds consultation. Again, I mean, yeah. we're, we're, our experience, the, the mistakes that we've made, what we've learned over the years, how to save somebody so much time and money and stress by you know, offering them, offering them consultation, you know, and being able to speed up what they're trying to do in a new emerging market. And again, you know, New York, where I'm originally from and coming full circle and legalization and the, you know, helping people, you know, there with, that need help with their project, whether it be their home grow in the five, six plants or a, you know, nursery, which we're going to do with supplying commercial, commercial growers with thousands and thousands of clones and making legitimate, you know, contracts with our colleagues and other breeders, not just our own strings with, with some ego, mm-hmm. but to be able to then make licensing agreements and saying, Hey, Lance, we used we, we grew 10,000 of your clones this uh, month and we sold them to a client and we have 25 cents each for you. And yep. here's our bookkeeping. And it's totally like transparent. And uh, yeah, and they're being here's, grown here's in check every three months. Yeah, it's like wow, I didn't even do anything other than made a proper licensing agreement with them. So it's getting more spelled out. It's getting more professional. And again, I mean, the 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 people that aren't are going to either stay underground or they're going to fade away. And and again, it's it's interesting times right now. It really is. Yeah, so it people is. People getting interim. seeds, thousands and hundreds and thousands of them. I mean, we we do quite well with them. You know, I would say, and I'm not the only one who sells seeds. Yeah, there's a lot of people shining right now in the seed business. And and honestly, it's an interesting business because you do all this back work for years and then your product still might take years to get noticed. Well, I remember uh, one year in Span and Biz, I think I counted 15 or 16 booths with seed companies. But I know the next year I counted and there was 49. Yeah. Yeah, that's how double. it that jumped yeah. in in one year. Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. I think that was the first year also that American seed companies. Well, that is well, over. but again, yeah. there there's been that that explosion and that wave of, yeah. of of seed companies. You know, whether they're a breeder selling their own strains or whether it's a seed online company selling several different breeder strains, and they're doing that online type of thing. A lot yeah. of those guys so right now storefront, and there's a lot of them. And yeah, you know, people have to have thousands of strains. Think about a hundred, two hundred seed banks. 
with 20, 30 strains each, you know, 40 strains each is just keeps adding up. So I think you got growers too getting into the game who don't even care to grow. They just want to breed. I know guys yeah, yeah, that don't yeah. grow. They just, it's one run after another of full breeding. And, and, That's all they and do. Working just, the line and going back to the line and selecting and then working it again. Properly. And then seeing if it's, uh, there's less of that. I'm going to be dead honest with you. Yes. There's more of them selecting a, a in a, in the United States. What I'm seeing now is people will breed a run, you know, and find the keeper and hype that keeper up to the, the top of the mountain. Right then that will sell that breeder to everyone saying, look, this is the work he puts out. And then they'll just pump gear. I don't see a lot of people working the same line anymore. I see a lot of people taking a strain, crossing it to a bunch of stuff. And then next project, taking yes, a strain, crossing it to a bunch a of long time to do these one offs. They'll take the same mail with 10 or 15 different, um, these different strains that they acquired, whether it be five plants of that one or 10 of the other, other. And so that's why some are more limited release than others because they have less seeds after that run. Yeah. And they put this mail in the room with these eight new strains that are, they're going to release right away. They're not even going to test them. And they're going to say, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, you're lucky. You're going to get a lot of different phenos in here. And like, <laughs> hold on a second. I mean, didn't, didn't they grow? And we've got a hundred year old flower company in America, America with vegetables called Burpee. I mean, you would have thought, any of these so-called cannabis growers would have grown up maybe growing a tomato or a cucumber and you would have seen the continuity. I mean, it's like they all grow the same way. This is called proper breeding, you know? And yes. And now I it's think like it you, takes five generations. At least, at least three. A stable seed. Indeed, at least and there three. are people that are working the line, but it's very few and far between. And every yes. high times cannabis cup from the years before every year, my, my colleagues would come out with a new strain every single year. And I'm like, shit, it's like, is this a running race? This isn't a running race. You can't beat me in a running race. This, this takes time. You years. can't constantly keep coming out with new strains. And I'm like, Oh, maybe this is some marketing thing or something some of these guys are doing. Or again, when I brought new strains here and risked my life bringing them, whether it be on a plane or sending them overnight UPS, you know, and be honest mm -hmm. with that. Okay, people were like beyond excited 25 years ago. And I'm like, uh, maybe I don't know what's going on here. You're like, I really live this it's life. It's supposed to be weed here. And yes. people like, oh. so again, there's some interesting stories in that direction that we, you know, we'll eventually, you know, go into or whenever. But Ed, tell us about the beginning. What was your first time smoking weed? Well, my, friend, my friend, one year older than me, one year older than me, 15 years old in, in junior high school, came home with a couple of joints. He's like, Ed, I bought these in school from a friend on the football team. He's like, would you like to smoke them with me? I said, sure. We went down to the end of the road. We lit the two of them up. We didn't know if we got high the first time, blah, blah, blah. And a next door neighbor of mine was selling all different kinds of things, you know? And uh, basically, I was very, very, Lucky very attracted you. to the cannabis. And I bought an ounce, you know, and I, you know, would basically roll up, you know, First purchase tried to roll up ounce. 30 joints, you know, 30 joints. Wow. I would try to roll up out of the ounce and I would try to keep five for myself for free. And okay. I would then sell the other 20, 25 okay. at school, <laughs> okay. my joints okay. for free. And I'm like, Hey, I, I think I'm onto something here. I yeah. like this, you know, this is working out pretty good, you know? Yep. And I was the only one with the weed and none of my friends ever wanted to buy it. So how, old, was, how old were you? 16, 17 years yeah. old. You know, what right? type of weed was it? Was it sticks and stems? In the beginning, it was sticks and stems, of course, uh -huh. but because I've always loved it and I always wanted to know who is growing this flower. I mean, I'm, I, I love growing anything growing up with my, with my mother collecting uh, horse manure and turning the, the, the soil over and growing things on our land, you know, just in general. So when I was smoking better and better cannabis, the stuff from Oregon, the stuff from, from California, and here I am in New York getting some badass shit at $550 a quarter pound, you know, back then, you know, this is in, uh, you know, the early eighties, of course, you know, and I had some really dank ass bud and everybody wants to know where is this from and so on. And, you know, and I'm, obviously I was selling out faster than I can get it in. Would that indoor, you think, indoor. was that the start? Oh, yeah, that was the, the start of indoor, from, right? From was back it? in Oregon and people were in uh. high tech stuff doing single cell hydroponics and they had, you know, one plant wow. to one hydro set up. And they were moving ahead, obviously, with, with you know, state-of-the-art stuff back then. So we were selling that, smoking that, of course, and, and selling that. And, and if it wasn't that, then we were getting five pounds that were sent in on a plane. And back then, you didn't even have to be on a plane back then. My friends would check in five pounds that down in Arizona going to school there. But they would get over the border from Mexico, put that on the plane. So I'd walk into the airport when they tell me about when the plane's going to arrive. And I'd walk right on out after what bag they tell me to pick up with five pounds, like right out of a movie. So they would let you send a, uh, basically a suitcase without a person. Of course, yes. <laughs> That's oh, amazing. Yeah. Now they wow. take the bag off the plane, of course. Man, let's go backwards. So, yeah. you know, I mean, so we had the, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the pounds from Mexico at you know, $500, you know, $400 a pound back then. So that was that for, from the beginning part. But the, the high grade is what then everybody wanted. And when... And dried up, 
And we said, hey, we got to grow our own. You know, we're not, we don't have enough. So then we started learning and reading, you know, Mel Frank and Ed Rosenthal's books and how to grow indoors and get a light and a hydro setup. And, you know, again, we started slowly and, and connected with different people. And the first girlfriend of mine bought seeds from SSSC, you know, a, <coughs> a famous, you know, seed bank, uh, you know, Sativa Seed Club, you know, from, from Neville, of course. And, oh, you know, put yeah. the money in the mail, sent it out like so many other people around the world did. And we got seeds and you know, my girlfriend got them in and she's like, hey, I got these. We're going to grow them. And, you know, so. Bird seeds. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. just love growing cannabis and breeding and, and smoking different varieties. Like Mila said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's, uh, you know, bubble later hash or, or dry sieve, you know, it's, it's smoking connoisseur one, all kinds of great hashes or rosin. Bring it on. She's not going to, the connoisseur is not going to say no. With quality. Not the board. quality. No. Well, I yeah. want to say something about okay. that. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> I, must say, <laughs> I must say, I personally, I prefer made with the water, ice water. Prefer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I know that probably with the dry one, it has more terpenes around it. Indeed. If people like taste and smell, they should smoke dry. Sick. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> with uh, water, mostly those Aspects are gone, but it's goddamn stronger. It's interesting so you say that. <laughs> yeah, she's totally right. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It, that's an interesting point because before mm -hmm. we knew about rosin, um, I'd say about 2000 in, in, in Florida, four, four or five, okay, uh, we had purchased a machine, a pollinator machine, and we would spin it, okay? We would collect everything because we would run the trim and then we would run for us, the guys smoking it, small buds, you know? And then maybe a few big ones. And we would then take that product and wash it through bags. And so we we were do, we had no one to tell us like, oh, no, just do this or oh, don't do that. So we were trying different things along the way. And then we would dry it out. And that was before you had basically vacuum freezers like how they have now that pull out, you know. So we were we were pressing it out into almost coins and things like that. Then we started to heated up with a torch we, we were trying to differ all these different techniques yeah but love smoking hash i love putting it on a screen with a cherry mm -hmm. and passing it between a bunch of growers i mean even to the point of finger hash when you're trimming or trim hash that used to be the best, the best. it is <laughs> it, the best. i love for the someone's first time mm -hmm. introducing them to scissor hash yeah. or finger yeah. hash mm -hmm. yeah. because it's so intense of a onset that usually you're like oh they, they, they don't even know what's coming you know it's that first time high again right excellent new excellent york Miami. must have been nuts yeah. i can only imagine the seed game the weed game because florida was so far behind all that so you came you came back to to amsterdam in 80 like 88 from yeah. india yeah what was so and then you started to grow what was it like shifting mm -hmm. into the 90s like how how did the coffee shop start opening up? How did that, how was uh, that? I, I mostly sold it and it was like a collective. So all the growers would sell to them and then the coffee shops would come to them. I very seldom sold it directly to coffee shops. Got wow. it. So in the nineties, what was Apart it? From the dump cring. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Forever. They've been around. Nice. In the nineties, what was it like in Amsterdam? Uh, Different from now. Like what was the, what was the differences from now? From now, wow, yeah. it was a lot more freedom. You know, Tell us. Uh, yeah, though now you could, I think you had to be 16 to be able to buy. I can't remember that there was any limit on how much you bought. Uh, that all came later. Was it like I don't really go to coffee shops all that yeah. often. <laughs> was, was it like festivals or sessions back then or gatherings? There were high times was the... <coughs> Highlight of the year, and <coughs> I don't know when they started. They have a legalized demonstrations and everything that happened also at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah, they had the legalized. They had a couple of local movements here that they would yeah. have an annual event. The local cannabis magazine, um, High Life, yeah, had an annual event. They did also, yes. You no, know, but High Times had that annual event that that was that first really big one that started to you know bring the community together in a way, and it was lasted a long time before. You know, again, things changed where not only did they put the five gram, which it is now limit on each purchase you can buy, even though you can go walking around to different shops, just it becomes an inconvenience. Do just the 500 grams that they're now maximum a coffee shop is supposedly allowed to have only max in the shop at a time. So then they got to create more personnel for runners to then stock them up as need be. More liability. So different things, more liability, different things changed like that over the year. 
you know, squeezing out the coffee shops, putting on bigger and uh, bigger putting, and fines and, and not giving uh, jail time, but putting on real high fines. taxes, high taxes. Yeah. You know, again, the taxes, the fines, you know, the, the people aren't doing, I mean, I used to have a house, you know, with 20, 30, 40 lights in them. And, and we just, we just don't do that anymore. It's just easier to try or not easier, but harder, but try to find smaller grows, a better, you know, little in-house friendly community. You do smooth, you know, smaller rooms and, and things like that to keep it safer and more long lasting. You remember the first, like the first Dutch genetics that were being grown? Do you know the strains they were? What were the first strains that you started hearing about hitting the scene? You K2? Know, uh, I don't know. Uh, when I uh, was growing, yeah, uh, we had orange bud and that had been smuggled in from the States. Oh, and okay. everybody agreed at that time that was the best available. So we never, you know, the guys I worked with, uh, they always said, if something better shows up, we'll switch. We had, but, yeah, there, was, there were a few things on the menu back but then. But I you never know. did. But yeah. then I stopped uh, growing in 94. We had uh, different things brought in. There was really very little back then, you know, Citral, yeah. you know, the different, uh, you know. Citral, yeah. Different names that they had. We had clones brought in, you know, and um, a colleague of ours was basically waiting with pre-soaked Rockwell cubes to get the clones for me. That's how excited they were to get the clones. Like landing a ship, and, you're ready and, to run. And, and, you know, again, time was going by. They got beat up in transit. So again, I parted with him earlier in the day. And then when I told the individual meeting him also later after having two meetings, Hey, I had to give him away at 12 o'clock, you know, make him, make, make him safe for everybody. And in a couple of weeks, he'll get rooted, he'll get healthy and I'll get you some cuttings. And that colleague threw his hands up in the air and said, there goes those genetics while he's waiting with pre-soaked rock wool cubes. And I'm like, no, no, no. The guy seemed cool. He'll, he'll, he'll give them back. And I hadn't yet moved here yet. So I didn't know new genetics were worth so much and, and coffee shops wanted to keep things and not, and, and, and board things. And it was not like, I mean, again, having an exclusive item in your shop or not really about not wanting to share it and give it out to somebody, but you had to lock in things back then. And then there'd be fights. People would get angry. Yeah. From good friendships would separate over a clone going I mean, somewhere where it shouldn't have gone back. Nothing's then. changed. It's still like that <laughs> right now. You know, and like, nothing's changed. You're, and, you venting and, to me about that right who's now got the real comforts cut? me a little bit. You know, who's got the real cut? You know what I mean? And how can you validate that as the real cut? Right. And, and and again, it's, it's, it's no different, you know, it's, no, it's no different. It's still Friendships still get bent and employees still get, you know, we're, we're, yelled at. We're yeah. really pushing to promote collaboration because yeah. the community does have to come together with what's happening with legalization. Like the real community and the real culture that's It'll, built this up to this far does sense. have to come together. I travel so, quite a lot. Like last year I did a tour with whole South America and organized the Dabadoo parties there. And uh, it is together. And awesome. in those countries, people are, you know, just keeping up and doing as much as they can. They're and loving some it. Some of the things they're doing are really good. They have their own good genetics. Though so nowadays, if I think the last Abidus, like a lot of American uh, varieties had crept in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're very popular down there. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's awesome. I love hearing that. And that's South America predominantly. Yeah, I was in Mexico, Colombia. Um, we couldn't go to Chile. They were having some riots. Um, we were in um, <laughs> these Argentina? names of God. Argentina, Uruguay. No, I was there the year before. I wasn't there last year. Anyway. And so I'm sure people brought you a lot of samples Columbia. and would want to show you their Columbia. work. That's Colombia. Yeah, I mentioned. Columbia. Oh yeah, Colombia. Who do you think down there is growing the best uh, cannabis right now? Is there one one place that actually has, like if we went down there to travel, something we would really like? Re yeah, Colombia wouldn't be a bad choice at all. Awesome. I love that. That's really cool. Or Argentina. I, There's contacts there waiting. Yeah, they need yeah, help. yeah. They need help I there also. There. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Definitely Argentina. In Uruguay, they, that's more that they need the contacts and they need help. And um, In Colombia. Brazil I was, soon too. Soon. Costa Rica is similar, you know, there's very, the laws are very strict down there. Yeah. But yeah. The people that are there and growing are devoted and they are all knowing each other. I've Absolutely. smoked some in fire Argentina, in Costa Rica. They're, they're like all connected online. So I could imagine traveling all the way down and everywhere there's a city and everybody in the city is part of it and all the way up the other side and you could do it. There was, they have clubs in every Village sometimes. You do have a tight culture there. Yeah, yeah. she's right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. He has, a, he went to Colombia and, uh, he, and basically experienced the cannabis culture. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. It was, it was, I actually met a humble grower that was living in Colombia and he had some shark tube. 
And yeah. uh, they're they're doing something where it's like 25 plants per household. So they're just getting each household to do their part. And it's uh, interesting. It is. Tell us about what you're smoking, Mila, what you what you smoke on the regular. Uh, actually, uh, I can't afford to go in these coffee shops and pay a hundred euros a gram for some isolator. <laughs> I refuse to do that. It's very tough. So it's probably some kind of Moroccan. <laughs> and honestly, it's not the quality of the stuff we've been smoking now. Uh, we, we've been to a uh, bunch of places. Actually, not I don't even... know. I'm not even making these. I don't know who's, what they're putting in. Maybe it's some, actually it's some really nice stuff there. Excuse me. Hold on. She's the only one. Excuse me. I didn't drop this one. She's the only one. That does gift with purchase backwards. You buy her product, you have to come back and give her a gift. <laughs> yeah, you get well, the idea well, from what you make from her products. Ah. So then it's gift with purchase backwards. I like it. <laughs> then you end up on the wall. <laughs> then you end up, you on, end the up on the wall. The, wall. Yeah, the like little that. piece. Hey, I, it's worth it to end up on the wall. This is go. legendary. <laughs> it is. All the wall. I mean, every wall. We're definitely going to get some footage of all this and. Make sure it's a part of the video. This is it's amazing. It's Just incredible. Look up close and really see the names and places where all this hashes came from, and the fact that the hash is actually in there, yeah, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. in every yeah. small picture frame, and the hash is still in there. Yeah, yeah. very impressive. So when you stopped growing and and leading into the two thousands, when did the pollinator come around? Like, what inspired uh, yeah. you to be an entrepreneur within the space and create? Uh, you know, a, a in ninety four, I was still growing at that time and I grew in a greenhouse and it was 4,000 square meters. I don't know, is that 5,000 square feet? Anyway. Wow. Huge. Big. There's a picture of it up in the museum oh, and we wow. got bust on that. And then I didn't get caught, but uh, actually nobody was there at the time they busted. And, Good. Uh, at that well, we saw the police cars driving and we were just on our way out. And we that had to realize, be sweet. Yeah, that we, was sweet. We didn't Ooh, see it until the news. You got to go home news. and smoke hash. It was yeah. on the news that night. And Celebrate. And we saw, recognized it. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Yeah. But then I suddenly realized, wait, I'm running too big a risk. I've got four right. kids. I'm a one single parent family. What the hell's going to happen if I had to the kids right. in there? What's going to happen with the kids? But at that time, I'd already made my first pollinator when I came back from India. And because I was growing out the material, I was doing it on a flat screen and kind of waffling it. And then uh, one night I'm in front of the clothes dryer where the clothes tumble around to dry. And I thought, whoa, they're doing the same as what I'm doing by hand over the screen. So wow. the next day we got a secondhand clothes dryer and... I think we just tied some screen around it to uh, remove the heat, threw some material in, and low presto, all the crystals were falling down. So that was the beginning of it. And we still make those pollinators in all different sizes. And that's incredible. Wow. That so that was brilliant. the first prototype. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's an invention made right Where there. Where did it go from there? When you, when, you, when you saw that working, how long did it take you to go from that to making the product and actually selling the product. Actually, the one of the very first ones we built, and that was just out of white chipboard and <laughs> stuff like that. Wow. We uh, brought to an after party for the high times. Was that 95 maybe? And it was Rob Clark who put a, had put a black velvet cloth over it, and he was the first to present it. He was probably the only person at that moment who realized the potential of being able to separate crystals, just a machine like that and not have to sit for hours and do it by hand. And it took off from there. I think we had two machines at that time and we sold them both and had enough money to go and make four or five. And, and that's how it went. We used to go around uh, Holland in a little van and uh, bring a pollinator with us and visit different grow shops and say, I have some material. And we have something to show. So we'd sit <laughs> and we'd put their leaf in the machine and uh, drink the coffee. And as it was happening, I could see what was happening. <laughs> back, back then, again, another thing to talk about changing. Uh, grow shops were able to sell clones back then. Yes. I mean, they were great yes. places to yes. go and gather and yes. to talk and so on and, yeah. and, and be able to buy plants and then get more information like that. And then the pressure started coming on up. I mean, one of my own bus, you talk about seeing the police pass by. I, I went to ready to make a harvest and I uh, bring there going there with my bicycle and make, make pictures of our harvest and the place is getting busted as I'm pulling on up and I'm getting ready to lock up my bike and the cop detective comes out of the door and he's 
looks at me and says, you, you coming here? You, you want to be here? Uh, and I, he goes, there's a marijuana bust plantation going on, being, being busted. <laughs> I said, uh, no, I think I'm looking, I, I need to be on 32, uh, 32 uh, New Adike. You know, I, I, I'm on the wrong road. Yeah, thank you. And I got on my bike and I pedal off. You know, but later on, it was still, you know, my name. And I had to go to court and pay a fine and, you know, so on and so forth. So again, it's been this cat and mouse game and, you know, how things have changed and evolved and, you know, different situations on how it's they either like you here and you stay and pay a fine and you're still in the system or they don't like you and, you know, you get kicked out. You know, Amsterdam has a way of doing that. Got it. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's it's interesting how they handle the situation yeah. and, and, and how it's just a fine and they cut it down and you kind of got to move on and just be smart about things. Or you're gone. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, about seven years ago, I got letters saying that uh, this was a, a criminal organization and all the workers were criminals and da 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 da. And uh, yeah, at that point, we were right in the center of town, actually. And um, that, that was my own property. So I decided to sell it because um, if the police decided to close us down for six months, then how can I pay the mortgage and all the rest of it? Yeah. Smart, so, smart business. And yeah. for seizures too. Yeah. yeah. Get so that. we ended up over here that we just rent and. Uh, so it's perfect. It's and we love it. It's man. an awesome Space facility. Safer. Pollinators Super up to the dope. sky. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you went from two to four to four to eight, I mean, how many pollinators have you sold to date? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. A high no, number. Ever uh, count those out. I mean, yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. It is. I know years ago at the Boston Freedom Festival, it was Bobby Black, I think, asked me, did I think already enough hash had been built, made to build a pyramid? <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Make a scale model. We'll try. I know, right? You know, One some ten. people just got a small uh, machine or whatever, and they just have one harvest a year and that's it. Other people, they're just going nonstop and they're having big grows and they use the same machines for a few years. Yeah. You know, maybe change the screen if necessary, but for the rest, uh, it'll work. So to say how much has been made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Do you think the customer coming to the shops and coming out here has changed or is it basically people from the United States and other places obviously coming out for cannabis and it's just... The same vibe, you know? Well, again, they're trying to squeeze that out. I mean, the mayor is trying to tighten that up. And yeah. again, this is the place that people still like to travel to, you know, that, that coffee shop experience. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah. uh, you know, on-site consumption lounges, you yeah. know, properly done from the beginning. Amazing. You know, and just only, you know, Nevada, right, just, you know, got that full circle only yeah. a couple of months ago. And thankfully, New York is going to allow for it also. Wow. But this is the, the you know, the, the epicenter of that lounge. Come play a chess game. Come talk with your friend. You know, have a place to socialize, you know, just to have a little snack, you know, and have something to smoke. Not, nothing criminal about that. Yeah. But what's fucking bothered me, you know, again, and, and nobody, the Dutch, you know, don't call it out. Somebody like me, a loud talker from New York would call it out. <laughs> but the backdoor <laughs> policy, which is beyond frustrating and, uh. and, and irritating, that only one part of the industry can be legalized. Tax and regulated out the front door, but the back door is just like this leprechaun. They, the Dutch believe a leprechaun bring the hat, bring the cannabis and hash into the coffee shop. A leprechaun. It doesn't make any sense. And then they're trying these experiments to, to, to try to regulate a few places, not that many few growers to grow four designated shops. And that's not really the right way to go and how they choose who's going to do it and what kind of licensing or what they're allowed to process or what strains they're allowed to grow yep. and, and all the above that they see how the world is going and the Dutch really are pioneers. They need to say like almost overnight, okay, we are going to authorize these licenses. They start immediately, if not sooner, pay your fee, follow these rules. And if you don't bang, then you're done and you don't get a second chance then, you know, I mean, that's how they think it through. They're open-minded. They make a move and they, they take action and they have the great way of resolving everything. The Dutch and, and my loving experience of living here for so long, you know, and, 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 and watching that. And it's like, they could, they could take it. They could take the, the rain. They still can actually take the rains back. The pioneers and, you know, taking the rains take back. It back. I think yeah. in uh, the mm -hmm. mid nineties, at that time, you had 10,000 growers in Amsterdam. <sighs> Little, usually it was just wow. a bedroom or an attic yeah. or a ceiling. Every few homes almost. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. Then they forbade that. Well, they threatened that they lose their house, they lose their uh, security system. Wow. So people got scared. They had kids. So what did they end up? They only ended up with big growers that are mostly just growing for the money. So I think the quality 
then most of the coffee shop must have gone really down the hill. I because agree. then you used I to get these people that were the real lovers of it and would spend all their energy, you know, on 20 plants. And mm-hmm. it was just really bad. And want a somewhat normal life. Don't well, want to have a gun and you know, don't want to have to have that lifestyle that's accompanied by a big grow and a lot of crazy stuff. People lose we, their we homes. We used to have quite some uh, grows at some point, but then all the uh, people that were manicuring, we would give them a two lamp setup that they could put in a cupboard of net. We would supply them with nutrients, with clones. These people would maybe make a, you know, 1500 guilders in those days, every two, two and a half months. But, you know, and to all the problems they made for these people, you know, in Holland, it's just <laughs> insane. It wasn't your fault. Right. No. Yeah. Exactly. Is, you are helping them, Mila. You, <laughs> no. Don't let them do that to you because they try to do that. <laughs> It's crazy, though. We didn't realize, and I don't think a lot of people do, how they really uh, cut the head off the snake for the back end, like you're saying, because quality control alone, it, you can't find a grocery store here. You can't. I mean, I went it's on Yelp difficult, yeah. in America. I go on Yelp and I just say hydroponics. And I mean, I have a list of store within a mile of my house mm-hmm. here. I started Googling. Next thing you know, I'll go down a rabbit hole. It's unbelievable. They've literally weeded out all the grow stores. Many of them. Because yeah. they were accusing them of supplying big growers. And, um, you know, so that everybody who suddenly had sales of 250 lamps in a day would, uh, that's what they were looking for. But they went to also, because most, like I say, when there was 10,000 growers here in Amsterdam, they weren't particularly big ones. Um, but still those grow shops would get closed because they'd have too many sales or whatever reason they could think of. I think uh, Holland lost uh, at least two thirds, three quarters of the grow shops they used to have. Yeah. And and I mean, some of the small batch farmers who bring in those small batches of fire to the coffee shops, I get it. They don't want to risk it. I I, I know. I remember those days, you know, I really do. Mm. Yeah, man. It's so different here. Then you think coming from the U.S., you think like, well, they allow weed and they allow other things. Yeah, I thought it's it was a lot more, well, to be honest. That's so strange. Every time I go over there, they, I say, oh, I'm from Amsterdam. Oh, I've been there and I'm going to go again. And I say, don't bother. If you want to go, go to Barcelona. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I absolutely love it here. I've been but finding. now I hear that very recently, apparently, all the clubs. You're trying to close down the, yeah. sh- the, the yeah. social They're club. They're still open, Barcelona. though. They're still open right they're now. Still They're open still fighting. People think that they're not going to close it, depending. The lawyers, I mean, you know. Lawyers will fighting f- find a way to delay yeah. it, of course. There's a lot of, you know. It's an interesting tactic they're using over it. there. You know, and how they're yeah. set up. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's very a beautiful city just it, like here. So, yeah. It was like magic compared to uh, uh, how it was going over here can, for quite a few years. Can you can you yeah. speak on the Cali culture coming into places like Barcelona and Amsterdam? Mm, I have not been a grower for a long time or a weed smoker. What about you, Ed? What well, do you think? There were premium <laughs> yes, flowers yeah. coming in here and people were getting a premium, premium price for, for a flower. You, that, what that what percentage just, of the market do you think that is right now? Well, again, I mean, the, the Dutch, you know, predominantly, you know, again, they like to smoke hash in because it goes a lot further. They mix it with the tobacco, you know, typically, you know, pretty much most of them. Uh, so it will last a lot longer, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, as far as the market, I would say it could be, say, 70, you know, 60, 70, you know, hash to, to cannabis, perhaps. There's a lot of flowers, though, you know, consumed. I mean, just in one strain that's in every single shop of, you know, amnesia haze that's called five different things. <laughs> You know, yeah. right. you can imagine every shop has at least, the, you know, the 500 grams are allowed, you know, a portion of that of that one strain and some in backup, you know, some put aside then for more reserve. Would right. you it's say that it's shop. M- so mostly you can imagine. Cali though, or can or right. Amsterdam? Well, well, Cali, weed. no, okay, the same with the, more so with the local weed, because of course it's grown here locally, but the import is getting a premium. It's got the hype behind it. You know, all the fancy, you know, names that are like, you know, dessert or something that you're going to eat. I mean, I'm not going to hype up any one strain name. Yeah. But you know them as well. And, you know, they'll, they'll pay, you know, 20, 25, 30, you know, 35 euros for a gram of cannabis, you know, and again, you know, yes, it's great weed and it's, you know, super fire in a lot of cases, especially if it's worth it on that end over there. But again, then they have, you know, logistics, bureaucracy, you know, you know, taxes and importation and who's got to get paid to bring it in. Oh, well, it gets expensive at the end of the day, you know, to pay that much for. Yeah. It's not realistic for most people. 
Of course. And so if, I, if I want some good fresh Dutch crone flour, where should I head first? And it was a call. You call me right away. <laughs> oh okay. no, Denied. no. Well, what, which coffee that shop? If, for the listener, you know what I mean. Okay. For someone that doesn't yeah, have okay. access. For the, for, for the listener, you know, again, um, it, it's again. I would say shops have some shops have a few good varieties, and they or they try to find a relationship with a couple of growers to then try to at least maintain some kind of continuity of quality, even if the strain is being changed up, um, you know, to plug in any, any one shop, you know, again, uh, these guys are new kids on the block. I have no relationship or even business to them yet. Okay. But you know, the guys at the Terps army guys are setting some, some new fire, you know, high prices, Shout out to Terps you army. know, a uh, shout out, you know, again, you know, I don't, you know, have any endorsement, you know, friend relationship even with them yet, but you know, we have a good vibe for each other. Good people. Definitely. And it seems, uh, you know, they're trying a, a, you know, a new strategy, working with the shop locally, coming in with different products again things aren't cheap but again i guess hopefully you get what you pay for Absolutely. so there are there is a connoisseur market or somebody who wants to treat themselves on their birthday or whatever it may there's be and they'll new, buy a premium there's but. a new culture arising and they prefer high 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 end cannabis connoisseur cannabis that is cultivated in conditions and push that we haven't seen before well and i think a lot of it comes into play is genetics that. i think if with the right genetics brought out here I prefer local cannabis. I want it, if possible, Fresh, the guy across yeah. the street. When I, uh, Dizzy Duck brought us over a bunch of cannabis and I was thoroughly impressed by, I was able to peel off the nug and the trichomes on each piece was like, oh, this has not been traveled very far. This is local. Mm -hmm. And Fire. I love that. Versus I go to the shops and I can only, I know all the strains. I've smoked them all in Cali. I've smoked them probably from the grower they look a lot different because there is a huge difference between packaged and imported weed and locally grown weed. And people are missing out on so much when they smoke imported weed. It's different with hash. It is. I know it's different with hash, but with weed, I just, there's nothing like local weed. It even, it's the look, the trichomes, yeah, everything. It doesn't normally travel well with most people. Again, the, 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 the packaging, you know, the bouncing around on, on, on so many different transports and stuff how long it takes to get there. There's just many variables indeed. I'd like to see that being more legitimized so I could help maybe even correct that issue. Because again, I would like it to see it go from point A to point B and it'd be just as good as that location. And, and that's what you're paying that premium for. Do you yeah, think that know. genetics would solve that problem, Pack Odds? I mean, even Ed, like, do you Gen think that if they had the right genetics out here, would that, would people still then just keep buying Cali? I'm not sure. What I'm noticing though, is that all parts of the world has Cali wheat traveling to it. Yes. And I don't know whether one should be happy with that because it's getting more and more difficult to find the authentic um, strains, strains from that area. From that area. Yeah. 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 It is because we came here and I keep saying, I'm looking for, I say, I walk up, I say, what's the best? And they can easily tell me what they prefer. Right. And then I ask, what's the best Dutch strain? Like, what do you have? In, and they have to sit back and think now. I've had people really have to go back and and I thought, wow, that's so different from what I expected that and it's from the government coming down on people. It's not people's passion has gone anywhere. It's that it's I mean, you can't even buy a carbon filter here. Yeah, you couldn't be more right. I mean, the you know, the, the super silver haze, the amnesia haze, you know, just to name those two strains are, you know, beyond prevalent. You know, it, it's just like they're, they're they have a good yield per plant. You know, they're easy to, to get from whoever has any more clone businesses around anymore. You know, it's just constantly reproduced and that's the, the one. I mean, again, if people had more varieties and they knew they were going to get the same yield and they didn't have to lose a few months to experiment with that, then maybe there would be more diversity. But again, it's just like, keep it simple, stupid. And that's just like what they keep doing. And depending on how it comes out, it's called a few different things. But so many again, famous strains from you here. Know, when you come over, you'll see the passion and you'll see the variety. And you'll see the, you know, the small scale farmer because we put most of our energy into producing seeds and, and have to be very careful with everything we do that then you'll say, Hey, this is nice to have some local homegrown flowers of this quality. Absolutely. But there's never enough, even to offer to friends, yeah. you know, at a, at, a, at, a fair, at a fair price. Ain't the that the truth, everywhere. man. The problem. There's I never a small batch. I think people but, keep the homegrown for themselves and their friends. Yes. Well, well, you know, <laughs> small, ba small batch grown quality yeah. cannabis yeah. does not go far because oh. people keep it for themselves. You're, you're right, Cody. And what would be a market at a any level, price for it? 
And, but there is oh, a for that quality. There is a level of top tier. I won't call it commercial cannabis, but I'll call it top tier triple A cannabis with packaging and clever branding and really good flavors and really good turf profiles that I feel are are finding their ways everywhere right yeah. now. And uh, it's interesting. It's it really is to 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 follow up on it and to these most of these guys are our friends and there's they're growers in California. Mm-hmm. And now we just need to open you up know, those lines of communication. And like, I like what you said, let's, let's bring some genetics and let's get some Dutch times Cali or whatever we got to do to have locally grown. Like let's, let's start to mine some well, things. I feel, I feel like in Cali, like they would appreciate a fire, super silver haze grown by somebody. I'm surprised they don't by yeah. now with all the people that have come here over the years, you know, I mean, you know, so tra- people have traveled and, here on the earlier and vice versa cups. for some Dutch growers you know? to, to grow some of the new gear that, that people are, you know, putting out over in Cali right now. But so. again, like well, I call they it, are, they are like the genetics, they bring the land races from thailand and cambodia and the different places i call it acclimating the genes and and growing the thai land race we're growing now under under top of the line you know without plugging them in who we actually are working with right. you know a led company that's that that's killing it right now with their quality you know swiss and german and austrian made top quality i mean it's like something was made 30 40 years ago heavy metal material and very well made the the leaf structure then changed shape. It started growing differently. Then we cloned the mother plants. Now they're growing back exactly how they were growing in Thailand. Very thin, long bladed, you know, sativa leaves like you'd expect. So the different environments. So again, we're working on, you know, sexing them out, flowering them out, out seeing how they're going to grow here. How long are they going to grow? Watching it on the calendar and see the varieties and, and breed and then bring it back then to Thailand and so on and so forth. And the whole process and the timeline. What are you working on right now, strain wise? That's like the newest thing that you really enjoy Again, I really like to know we have some serious solid land races crossed with some serious, consistent, stabilized hybrids to really mix the best of some of the old world and and very close to, you know, land race strains in with some really new stuff. Not a fancy name, but, you know, bringing out very different terpenes, different variety and colors and bud structure and actually have somebody who's never smoked cannabis, but who's very interested in knowing about it, maybe not smoking it right away, but to be able to display six, seven, eight different jars in front of them and let them inspect it and have them think that it's all one kind, one of the same brickweed or whatever, something with seed in that maybe they saw in the sixties at some party at college or whatever in the (laughs) dorm, somebody bought home some reefer, you know, or something and whatever. But again, they're so different and and, and they're amazing. I mean, I love orchids. I love roses. I love all these different species of plants, you know, as a grower, even in my own home, so many different things growing are, Director of horticulture must have four or five different chili species growing, you know, from the world, and they're they're thriving. And you mind us bring you some, Mila? Yeah, they're beautiful chilies. Wow, and the passion for the plant doesn't it extends past cannabis? Indeed, I mean the Carolina Reaper, you know, it's amazing chili, the hottest pepper in the world. I mean, the thing's wow. impressive on how it grows. Don't bring me that one. All right, no, we'll <laughs> yeah. I know. We'll try to bring them, Nick. I know a breeder who will send you a free pack of seeds. He'll, but you have he'll send you a Carolina Reaper, and you have to eat it on camera. And then he'll send you some seeds if you eat it. Oh, I love and that. And he grows, all. he yeah, grows them all. You got a good all. challenge. That's a new <laughs> challenge, bro. Wow. It's a crazy, it's a, you should see people. Some we, people can we, eat. We got to get you on video doing that. I mean, all right, let's <laughs> figure it out. I think you can get a handle, big dog. No, no, no. I always like the, you know, the, the cannabis versus the alcohol challenges. You know, like they're playing football or they're trying a game and it's just amazing. I they like always in better, the people drunk and shit falling down on the ground, running into each other. Yeah. And the cannabis people are like always winning and stuff like that. And it's just like, hey, you know, you see those videos off to the side, but and, I'd and, like to see more of that. In the early nineties, I remember they had football games between the different coffee shops. Wow. That was great. The whole audience was smoking. <laughs> and if they didn't have enough people, some of their customers would join their team. That was amazing. That's great. That is, wow. I mean, that camaraderie and that fun is, uh, that's super cool. I, I love yeah. that culture. Yeah. There's a big festival today. I don't know if, if you guys have heard about it, called Mids Fest. And it's a big. Off Mids. Off Yields Mids. Found, by the Yields Foundation, Mr. Kanko. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's yeah. going to be some. Yeah. I'm going to go. I may go, but I may yeah. have to, you know, Glad I, to hear that stuff like that's happening yeah. out yeah. here. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, more and more. Again, people are starting to try to get people together again, just even in gatherings, of, of course, in yeah. general. but. We've been blessed yeah. with some beautiful weather. It's been amazing. You were very uh, lucky. You should have been here 10 days ago. You would have had should a week have not. of rain. <laughs> oh, just man. in time. Yeah. No, it's been great. With some we pretty love the city. intense monsoon like. Yeah, it's been That's why everything's so lush. I pulled yes. in and I couldn't. Yeah. Bu- I was like, oh, my God, look how green everything is. Yeah. Coming from California, doesn't rain. 
does oh, it. We don't good, have that's a good compliment for here. I yeah. love California it. California is very green. I think a lot of growers that would need to be here will fall in love with it. And not just the cannabis scene. I mean, just the scene in general, the people, the food, the, the, the city is unbelievable. It, it's a beautiful city. No doubt. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you know, <laughs> Venice, you know, Barcelona, Paris, you know, England It's a little bit of everything, like all wrapped up into one, into this small little city village, you know, town where you bike past people, you know, that you, you know, know, and you just cross paths and it's very, very intimate in that kind of way. And everyone's out and about. We got here and I couldn't believe how many people were out of their houses, yeah. communicating with each other, not on their phones. It was so different that we took, no, we were like mentioning it to each other. Look how many people are still out and about. And then even when the sun went down in America, right? And these are just so small. All the lights would be on in different houses. And you can say, oh, they're home, they're home, right? That was not here. Everyone's lights are out. Everyone's out and about still doing stuff, getting trip. It's just very different. And it's so enjoyable and refreshing. Mm-hmm. I just want to, I mean, people it need really to come is. out here. This time of year where it's still sunny at like 10 o'clock at night, it's really nice to, to go out to the cafes this time of year and just, and, and stroll. It's nice. A beautiful city for strolling. Amazing. In the, Happy summer, to be in the here. summertime, because yeah, it can be light until 11 at night. Mm. But wow. In the winter, it can be dark by 4.30. 4.30 <laughs> in, in the scary. afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Cold, yeah. dark, and rainy and windy. Yeah, yeah, yeah all the yeah. elements. That's get working you weather. That's very, working weather. Very, very, very raw, yeah. That's when you got to disappear. Yeah. Indeed. Man, and I just want to mention too, so Ed pulled up on some seven-year-old hash, cut us off a small That's piece. Crazy. That is OG Kush sourced from Mendocino. Right could, could you, Simpson Kush that our, our colleagues grew up there. And it, it's just the one that we treasure for a long time. I have very little piece left, as, as you see. And bless yeah, us with us. Oh, man. man. I mean, I cannot Could you wait. pass me the pipe, Ed? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, one more off before we end Ed this has thing. a hash pipe. He has this badass hash pipe that has a carb on the end, almost like a little cannon. That's from uh, Carl Termini. He uh, recently okay. retired from uh, making glass, great uh, glass blower. He was here for many years. Uh, was actually, I believe, help, helping uh, autistic children uh, learn how to do glass blowing or something, I if it. I recall. And he had a grant on, but then again, even grants and stuff like that, like everywhere, die up after a while and dry up after a while. So he uh, had no choice. But then went back to America and so on and so forth. And he he makes amazing pieces. I think he's this tired, unfortunately. I, we, we, more uh, people need to get into this though. This is a lost art. Uh, th- we don't see a lot of this in America. Is smoking hash out of a dab rig. You only see people smoking dabs. This is a, it's a different high. It's a different experience. It's a different pipe. social experience. Yeah, only hash we smoke out of, you know, these kind of pipes, at least I do, you know, the, many hash pipes you'll see when you come on over as well. And then it, it's, yeah, it's a nice way to smoke hash, of course. Other than it's in, been in, amazing, like, like enjoying hash in this session. And I honestly think that I would love to smoke hash at night. You know what I mean? Just to wind down. It's a, it's a totally different experience. And anybody listening, maybe try to find some good hash. Yeah. Um, ice water hash as a Dry hash queen, sift. as the hash queen suggests, and um, you know, put it in a pipe and smoke it like yeah, that. This like is ice water hash, about. that one. I mean, it, it definitely Absolutely. is my favorite. Also, Absolutely. the high is strong. I mean, like Mila said earlier, it's just really it gives you that permagrin and you're sedative, <laughs> and, and, and 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 life is good. Yeah, Very yeah. shoulder, whole body. I get headaches often, and that's that's my that's my go to one when is I'm that really it? feeling sick. Absolutely, the new school doesn't yeah. know about this. Yeah. And don't, so don't we're here to educate them and let them know that, you know, ice water hash, smoke that out of a pipe. You might not enjoy flour like Mila doesn't, and you might enjoy ice water hash. Yeah. I mean, you it's know? such a different experience and that's what's Very dope different. about cannabis. You get to pick what you love about it and that's what you get to do about it. Like, do you like smoking hash? Do you like flour? Do you like dry sift? I mean, or do you so, like vaporize? I mean, there's a hundred different methods and it's been absolutely phenomenal. And I've been this. Uh, and I've been smoking only hash for like forty eight years. There we go. Wow. Seventy six now. I've never really been ill, and uh, I cycle everywhere. Mm-hmm. She's amazing with her cycling. You are wow. Yeah. Yep. that amazing. is amazing. Yeah, yep. with her new bike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have an old bike. I don't well, believe in electric bikes. Everybody. No, a new, no, a new one. I thought you had got a new one a year or so ago or whatever. No, oh, no, this is one of these rental oh. bikes and uh, huh. they sell them after two years and they're super strong. Mm. Bikes are crucial out here. Yeah. It's bike city. Yeah. That and mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome, I prefer man. what they do in England, chips with vinegar. Yeah. yeah. I prefer it here. healthier also. <laughs> All right, guys, we're wrapping up, man. Episode 15, this has been legendary and we're here with two legends and uh, thank you for so much for your time. 
giving us a tour of the whole Pollinator Museum, the Hemp Hotel over here. We appreciate you guys. First Welcome, smoke of the welcoming day. us into your, in, 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 in your country. It was really an honor and it was super great to be here with you guys. And I want to thank you and I want to say I love you and everybody who is listening in. Take care and have another talk. Ciao, ciao. Indeed. It was a pleasure meeting you guys. Looking forward to, uh, yeah, more uh, chatting, more collabs. Hope more hash. Future and more Absolutely. hash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Delta 9, baby. That's great. I'm going to keep up uh, success with the uh, episode, the programs, and uh, we keep it up. We keep earning. Looking keep forward to guys. seeing uh, the yeah. success in New York and cool. seeing New York come cool. about. Yeah. I really am. Yeah, I'm excited about what that city is going to bring to the scene. Because I know it's going to be something serious. They, they got have a mean hustle away. that's unmatched. That yeah. as well. And, and just, I think, a different level of professionalism that's going to step and up. And they the have game. some real industrial <laughs> space that is perfect for growing. Honestly. I mean, first smoke of the day done inside the Hash Museum. This is legendary. It's a great place. Yeah. Nice new uh, museum. Great new office museum. Light up some bubble yeah. and, and yeah. listen to this. Kick it's back, listen in. It's relaxing. still in progress, as you see. Sure, sure. <laughs> it looks like amazing. It. Kick back in, listen. First cool. smoke of the day, episode 15, signing off. Mila Hash Queen, my man Ed, Delta 9, Blackleaf, Pack Odds. Peace. Go. Peace.